Over the past couple of years, I've done a number of interviews about uh, perovskites, a new solar technology. Well, not even a new, no, new solar technology, but one that's been under development for a number of years. And today I'm going to be talking to Andres Vontanar, who's a solar analyst at Rethink Technology Research, about where perovskites are going. Uh, he's forecasting a big increase in demand uh, over the starting in 2026. So welcome to the interview, Andres. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Give me an overview of your study, if you will, please. So it, it, the point is to predict where perovskites are going. So if you've done several interviews before on perovskites, I probably don't need to go too much into explaining what they are. Well, um, it's done. Uh, hang on a second. Uh, a lot of our listeners and viewers will not have uh, seen those previous interviews. So let's start with, the you know, what is a perovskite? Well, it is a it, it's a material that is used in, in a solar panel. It's the material that turns light into electricity. So um, almost all solar panels today are silicon, uh, which has been the case for a very long time. Uh, there's a couple of alternatives which are used, uh, like First Solar is a big American manufacturer and it uses cadmium telluride. There's a few ones doing copper, indium, gallium, selenide. Um, those two, uh, especially the SIGs, is useful for uh, thin film. They're much lighter than the silicon panels. And so you can integrate that into um, facades potentially, although that's not a big market segment. Then you've got, uh, you've also got gallium arsenide, which is what they put on satellites. It's much more expensive, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, if you're putting something on a satellite, you just care about how powerful it is. Uh, now, perovskites, so they, they were discovered really in 2009. And obviously when you first discover a new semiconductor photo, for photovoltaics, it doesn't start out very powerful. And for the past uh, decade and a half, there's been a huge amount of work, an ever increasing amount of work in laboratories to see how far they can push it. And what's happened um, really just recently is that perovskite, uh, even by itself, has now caught up to the the uh, less popular ones I mentioned just now, cadmium telluride and SIGs. But it's it's still uh, going quite fast, and it will. I, I think it will even catch up to silicon by itself. And there's also tandem arrangements where you combine the perovskites with the silicon. So a perovskite is uh, it promises to be just better than silicon because you're adding it to silicon. So it's it will be better really in every every part of the solar industry, more powerful, not much more expensive. Now, my understanding is that solar panel efficiencies uh, now are around 25%. Is that correct? Um, that's more of a solar cell figure. If you look at the most powerful solar module, and there's a bit of a loss from cell to module, it's more like 22%, I would say, is the mainstream for a high-end product. The most powerful module would be 24.5%, but that's quite rare. But yes, and you, you're pretty much right. Yeah. And, and if we've got perovskite on its own, what's the efficiency? And what's the efficiency when perovskite is added to silicon? So perovskites by, its, by, by themselves right now are, I would say, the best results on a large full-scale module are, are pretty low still. They're down at 17% uh, compared to silicon over 20%. And um, that really does matter because, yes, it's, it's actually cheaper to make, but you know, a lot of the costs of a solar installation are everything else, the labor costs, the connection costs. So it's really the efficiency that matters more than the module cost itself. Um, however, if you're adding perovskites to silicon, even if it's not the most um, powerful arrangement that can be arranged, even if there's a huge amount of more progress to be done, it's by definition just going to be better. Because what you then have is you have the perovskites and the silicon. So you let the light shine on the perovskites first, and much of what the perovskites don't absorb then goes into the silicon to be absorbed. It's always more powerful. Um, and so a, a perovskite silicon tandem, it can easily enter the market in, in a couple of years at 27%. So okay. a, a quarter again is powerful. Okay. So uh, you are forecasting that we're going to be another two to three years before these more powerful panels uh, hit the market. But by 2030, it'll take up about a hundred gigawatts segment of the of solar. But what really caught my attention was when you forecast that it will dominate with 85% of the industry's output by 2040, 
and close to one terawatt of manufacturing each year. Uh, dominating an industry like that in such a short period of time, I was kind of surprised. Well, a, a big uh, part of the, the fundamental point of view for saying something that radical is that the solar industry is still very young. And if you look at how rapidly it's growing and how big it will be in the future, you could almost say it hasn't even begun yet. Because last year, globally, 220 gigawatts were installed. But right now we're seeing 50, well, 45 gigawatts manufactured each month. So that means 500 gigawatts manufactured this year, which means roughly speaking 500 installed next year. So that is um, more than doubling in two years. And the, you know, I write about it in, my, in my articles a lot. You can, no matter which way you cut it, no matter which uh, country you look at, the growth is just uh, absurdly rapid. Now, obviously the past couple of years are the most extreme growth rate you'll see because you have the post-pandemic recovery followed by the, the, the sanctions on Russian fuel. Um, so that really boosted all kinds of renewables and solar was the one that um, picked up the slack the most. Uh, but I also believe that once it is at 500 gigawatts, from next year it'll just continue to grow i mean it won't grow it won't some people for, say admit the existing reality that it's growing a little bit sorry i'll, I'll get to the point so it, it, i believe it'll, the entire solar industry will go to 1000 gigawatts in 2030 and from then it can go to 2000 gigawatts uh potentially I, i'm not entirely sure on that but it's in that frame so to say that perovskites will take over is not really that radical to say that it will have a thousand gigawatts um forming part of a, you know, both silicon and perovskite combined manufacturing. It actually fits with what we already believe about the industry. And you also have to consider that the perovskite manufacturing process is a lot less capital intensive. Uh, there's no Siemens process or Chukralski process. So it's a lot less uh, expensive to build. Okay, now, let's, now we're getting to the heart of it. Okay, so it's a lot less expensive to build. So the process itself is less expensive, less complicated uh, supply chains, lower cost per unit. And if I understand this correctly, we're still working with learning curves and rights law, where every time you double the production of something, you see a 15 or 25 percent uh, decline in costs. Is, is that a reasonable expectation? I would say that rights law actually started to tail off uh, for silicon PV, possibly even several years ago. Um, perhaps not in terms of the full scale industry, but in terms of modules themselves, in terms of the efficiency of the modules, the, there are theoretical efficiency limits that were being starting to be approached. Um, now, as the industry grew in size and all the research grew in scale as well, there has still been progress in silicon in just the past few years. But that's part of the, the reason perovskites will take over is they have a higher theoretical power than silicon. They have, they have not been examined half as much uh, they have far more room to grow and silicon is sort of hitting its limits and, and perovskites is how silicon can continue to, to push forward. And another uh, surprising uh, conclusion of your report was that U.S. will lead in manufacturing. And we've been accustomed to China leading on, on solar panels for so long that the idea that this technical innovation will, will boost uh, U.S. solar manufacturing uh, why? Why did what made you come to that conclusion? Oh, well, actually, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't say that the manufacturing will be exceeded in. Uh, by I think China will still dominate perovskite manufacturing. I hope we didn't miscolor a graph somewhere. Um, but what I did say is that um, China won't dominate perovskite manufacturing as much as it dominates silicon. And you will see. Uh, and yes, uh, North America will be uh, dominating perovskite manufacturing compared to the rest of the world outside of China. Uh, and that's because of the IRA, really. Okay, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, <laughs> and we're already seeing the IRA uh, increase the amount of solar manufacturing capacity in the in the U.S. And any insights into what we can expect from the U.S. solar panel manufacturing industry once it begins to uh, adopt uh, perovskite? Hmm. What we can expect to see, well. I think it's a big asset for the US that it has first solar. So despite China taking over the entirety of the industry and also silicon taking over the entirety of the industry, you still have these two major manufacturers outside of China. One is uh, Q cells in South Korea, which is, uh, and the other is first cells. Now first cells, because it's cadmium telluride, it's pursuing thin film. It's uh, really cutting edge for that. Um, it, and it has recently acquired, I think it was Evula, 
or some other perovskite startup, it was probably Evelar, for in the range of 40 to 80 million dollars off the top of my head. So that's a pretty large research team. And so First Solar is very well positioned to adopt perovskites. Um, having said that, there will be multiple other companies as well uh, pushing perovskites that I could talk about, like Kalux and Tandem PV that are American. Um, perhaps the biggest thing is I still have some doubts about building new um, polysilicon and wafer factories in the US. It can be done if necessary, but they're a bit investment heavy. And especially polysilicon is a bit sensitive to uh, electricity prices, which obviously are much higher in the US than they are in Xinjiang or in Mongolia uh, or Malaysia or somewhere like that. So, uh, and perovskites just dodge that. Let's talk about where they're going to be used, because you say that they're going to start out in the rooftop market and industrial and corporate customers then emerge in the utility scale uh, market later on. And I, and I have a, a specific question for you. There's a lot of interest here in Canada about uh, big industrial and commercial customers uh, self-generating with solar mm. and and then unplugging from the grid or consuming a lot less electricity from the grid. Is, is the perovskite innovation uh, likely to accelerate that trend at all? Oh, yes, it will accelerate the trend. However, I, I think the biggest, um, the, the first place that you'll go with perovskites, well, there's really two ways that it will enter the market first. One is as a pure thin film product without silicon, and that allows it to be put into to windows and such like, um, for example, in a heavily urbanized area. The other is uh, in tandem with silicon. So that means you're getting the, the highest amount of power per square meter. And I think that will be most relevant for uh, companies and, and roof um, uh, residential uh, owners with limited roof space. So actually for a large commercial enterprise with a lot of roof space, maybe um, maybe they will actually stick with silicon, traditional silicon a little bit longer. Uh, it's always beneficial to have a new powerful product on the market though. What's the upper end of efficiency, do you think, uh, once uh, perovskite has been combined with silicon and, you know, the the uh, production has been scaled up and we're starting to see some of the costs come down? What uh, could, could any possible chance that it could get to 30, 35, 40 percent? They will definitely get to 30 percent. I would expect that actually to happen in 2030. Now, if you look at theoretical efficiency limits, you're looking at 29.4 uh, as the theoretical limit for, for traditional silicon, and we're already able to produce uh, a 24.5% efficient module. So you're losing 5% efficiency. Um, now, if you look at, uh, so for example, a very futuristic uh, concept of perovskite in tandem with a different perovskite that has a different absorption spectra, and then a third perovskite as well with another different absorption spectra, that could that actually has a theoretical efficiency limit of 50%. Now, the full module efficiency wouldn't be uh, very close to that, but I, I, I do expect that whether it's the, a tandem of whatever kind, and you can actually combine it with any of these um, other semiconductors, and that will happen with cadmium, uh, SIGs, gallium arsenide any they can all be considered i think will be easily north of 30 percent and we have for years seen um leading companies like oxford pv say explicitly that their target is to reach uh, things like 37 percent in a ta uh, tandem uh, i do believe that will happen sometime in the 2030s yeah and well, that's uh that's easily 50 percent more power than than you get from today's panels andres thank you very much for this really appreciate your insights sure thanks